Hi friends, I just wanted to do a quick video in response to a question I received on a video. Michael Monroe asked about the flexibility of a specific sword. It's this sword here. Oop, hang on, I'm dropping everything. So it's this sword here, this is the Balor Arms uh, Knight Templar Arming Sword. And uh, I'll just show it off for a second. I have decided to make mine a little fancier by adding a couple of precious gems to my uh, pommel. So just showing off a little modification I did in case everyone's wondering why this doesn't look like the, the stock model. And he commented on a video I had where I was doing an initial review of the sword, which I happen to like very much. And he mentioned that his sword felt rather whippy and very flexible in the end. And he said, hey, you know, is this is this typical? How flexible is it? And I recommended that he do a test on it. So I'm going to talk about uh, testing the stiffness of the swords or the flexibility, depending on how you mention it. Um, and we'll, we'll bring that up in a second. So the stiffness of a given blade is actually the combination of several different factors. You have to consider the cross section or the geometry of the blade, the shape of the blade itself, whether it's a straight sword or whether it's a curved sword. You have to consider how long it is, whether it's a short sword or a long sword, and you have to also consider the heat treatment that was given to, to the blade itself. Um, again, when, when I mentioned the length, if you have a very, very long sword, even if it's quite thick, it will be very, very easy to flex. By the time you have something short, you can compress it quite a bit before it's going to start to, to yield under, under strain. So how is this measured? There's a whole bunch of different ways that it can be measured. Someone who wants to really get into the difference in looking between like the SCA flex tests and uh, the black fencer methods and ways of, of clamping it, I recommend you read uh, some of the articles that are put up by Sean Franklin. He does some really uh, great articles for uh, Sword STEM, I believe uh, it's, it is online. And he gets into the heavy science on what, how to compare the different methods, what are the advantages and disadvantages, um, how much variance you can find in them and the different techniques that should be used. I'm going to be using the black fencer method, which is not necessarily the most reliable. There are um, error, it is prone to certain inaccuracies and errors, but it is a reasonably easy one to do that does not require a lot of additional equipment and is very easy to see. So it's, this is something that can be done on a variety of different swords, so not just fetter short, for example, and it'll be quite apparent. So when you have a sword like this, this is something that Black Fencer, to the best of my knowledge, in, invented, although other people have probably been doing it before. You basically put the tip of the sword onto the uh, scale, a digital scale, then you apply force directly to the pommel. And again, um, other people may choose to put force in a different location, but for the purposes of this test being consistent, we're putting the force on the pommel, and then you apply force straight down into the tip until the blade starts to flex and bend. And again, different manufacturers may have different ways of measuring it. I've seen ones where they have a fixed load, so they test the sword and see how much it bends at 10 kilograms or at 20 kilograms and see how far it bends and they'll rate their swords that way. Instead, when you're applying force like this, it's going to, the number is going to increase on the scale as you're applying more and more and more force. And when it finally yields, once you finally reach the point at which the structural um, amount of the, the blade cannot take it anymore, the number on the scale will not be going up anymore because now you're compressing, you're, you're flexing the blade instead of pushing down on the scale. And that's the, the number that you read at, at that point. And again, different types of blade construction will flex differently. For example, so here I have a long sword and it has a lot of distal taper. So it starts off thick and it ends thin. And as I flex it, it flexes where you'd want a long sword to flex in the distal portion in the last quarter or so of the blade. However, with this messer, this messer exhibits very little distal taper. And as a result, when I flex it, it flexes much close to the center of the blade, like you'd see in some types of knives and machete. 
it doesn't exhibit the same type of flex right here in the foible of the blade. Another example is this flamberge. This flamberge starts at just over four millimeters here. And by this point here, it's still maybe three and a half millimeters or so. And when I flex it, it flexes pretty much right in the middle, almost as if it's just a simple bar. So that's something to keep in mind. Even if you're reading a number on a page from a manufacturer, that might not tell the whole story of the flexibility of a given blade. You sometimes have to look at the dynamic properties of it to see where the blade's flexing in order to make sure that it's giving the right performance for you. So what we're going to do is I'm going to take several of these swords and just run them through the, the test so that you can see how they flex and how they compare. What is the perfect amount of flex is going to vary quite a bit from sword to sword. I have antiques here. I have, let's say, uh, for example, I have an antique that flexes quite a bit. as a spadroon, but this Chinese Dao is quite stiff. And that might be counterintuitive. Everyone might think that the wide-bladed, very thin Dao would be the very flexible one, and the narrow, very uh, kind of thick spadroon would be the very stiff one for thrusting, but it's the opposite with my antiques. So just because you look at a sword, you can't always tell exactly how stiff the blade is going to be um, or what it's intended to be uh, without knowing the context behind its construction, the type of metallurgy, the type of heat treatment it's going to have. But I have some Albions here. I have some swords from different makers. I have some custom swords. Let's do a quick survey and see how they, they hold up. You'll forgive shooting vertically, but this is the best way to capture it. So, starting off with that same Balor Arm Sword, the little pad I have is a little paper pad, and this weighs 200 grams, so we can subtract 0.2 kilograms from any measurement that we have. So I put it in directly, and I start applying force. And this is not enough force to get my scale on, so I'll just activate the scale. There we go. And it stops at 9.2, so it's 9 kilograms. For science, I'll try it one more time. And again, 9.2 kilograms. How does the Albion compare? The Gudyalt, which is the same type of sword. This is a little stiffer. This comes in at 12.2 kilos. In my last video featuring the uh, Winter Cutlery Sword, there was a debate as to if this sword had a set in it or if it was flexing under its own weight. I can tell you now it's got a little bit of a set in it. It does seem stiff enough that it uh, is not flexing under its own weight. Let's see how stiff the Eric Usland uh, Winter Cutlery Type uh, 18C is. And again, this has been used by Philip Martin and others, so for it to have been beaten up, I'm not faulting the, the sword or the maker. Alright, so significantly more. This one comes in at 14 kilos. Try it one more time. Huh, that one only came through at 13 kilos. Let me try it one more time. Yep, 14 kilos. And now the, uh, the Albion Oakshot. Only 
Yeah, 8.5. Now that's funny because I don't think I've tested the stiffness of this before. Previously, I had described this as having a stiffer blade because of the double ridges on it than the Gedealt. Yet, obviously, that is not the case. This is not as stiff a blade as the Gedealt. And you can see it does exhibit a good degree of wibble wobble to the end. Very interesting. What about a hexagonal blade? This is the LK Chen Ribaldo. Alright, 11.6 on the first go. And 11.4 on the second go. How about this big Albion Baron? It's about 12.5. Just for fun, what about this Chinese sword? Here's the Snow Peak Republic era Jen from LK Chen. That's 12.9 kilos. Now, I've avoided doing any single-edged swords, but I will do a katana just because otherwise the algorithm will probably punish me. Here we go. I have to turn it this way. Ugh, 32.5. That's a stiff blade. <laughs> How much variation could there be with the same model sword? Let's try three different light cavalry sabers. The 1796 by LK Chen. Six kilograms. The 1796 by Windless. Nine kilograms. And the seventeen ninety six by Cold Steel. Eighteen point five kilograms. Cold Steel, what are you doing? So there you have it. That did not go with through every different type of sword in existence, nor even every type of sword I have here in the, uh, in the storeroom. But it should give you some idea of the type of spectrum that you have when it comes to flexibility or stiffness in blades. It makes a lot of difference what type of sword you have. It makes a lot of difference if it's a short sword or a long sword. It makes a lot of difference what type of cross section the sword is. And like we said before, it makes a lot of difference what type of heat treatment the sword has. Does it have a really springy sort of heat treatment like you'd find on a European blade? Or does it have a more stiff uh, differential heat treatment like you'd find in a lot of Asian swords, like an, on an Indian sword or on a Japanese sword? Um, as a result, uh, there's no one-size-fits-all rule in determining if the sword is too stiff or too floppy when it comes to the reproduction. You need to take it on a kind of case-by-case -case basis. There is a bit of a spectrum within a group or a subfamily. So if you have a, let's say, a cutting-type sword, so an Oakshot Group 1 sword, they're going to have a kind of expected amount of stiffness that you need to be able to perform their task. Um, compared to uh, Oakshot Group 2. Same thing with Sabres. 
But beyond that, uh, you have to kind of really dig down into the individual designs of the individual sword you have and figure out if it's acceptable within, just like sword weight and sword balance, it's all part of the same uh, spectrum. So what can you do? You can do the same sort of black fencer test and compare it with numbers that you have of swords of the similar group. Figure out if that's the sort of, of range that you want that sword to have uh, for the type of activities that you're interested in. Hope you guys found this useful. Feel free to leave comments and your opinions and your measurements for your swords. How stiff is your sword? When does it start to flex on the black fencer test? Make sure that you put something to protect your tip and your scale so that you do not go piercing through it and damaging your very important piece of equipment. Until next time, guys, take care.